Hello everyone and welcome to the after action report of our Hearts of Iron 3 game we played through as France and I've got to say we did a fairly decent job, at least in my opinion. Now this is an, uh, uh, a sort of a new thing that I'm trying out, I'm not sure if it's, uh, if it's really feasible, if it's going to go very well, but what you're looking at right now is a, uh, is a, a colored in map of uh, all of the provinces in Europe in Hearts of Iron 3. Now I know this is going to be a fairly static video, but uh, I'm a numbers guy and a map lover, so I figured that uh, that maybe you guys would like to uh, peruse this with me. Maybe we can talk tactics just a little bit and uh, sort of do a, an after-action breakdown of our strategy going into the game and how that changed as the game went on. You know the old saying, no plan ever survives contact with the enemy. I honestly think we did fairly well. Now our strategy as France was always to force Germany to fight a two-front war. That's the only way that France can stand up to Germany, in, in Hearts of Iron 3 at the very least. So our aim was always to have Germany's attention divided somewhere else. So, so that was our strategy going into it, and um, in September of 1939, this is basically the, the bog standard, yes, Germany's big, and now they've just declared war on Poland, and now is when the interesting stuff starts. You can see that Germany decided to basically just bash their heads against the Polish wall, and we decided that rather than just sit back behind our uh, Maginot line and just uh, let Poland be completely run over, we were going to do a little bit of a pincer attack. Um, I guess not really a pincer attack, a little bit of, a, of a, an attack through the Maginot line. Uh, and we actually did a fairly decent job of it. We, we took a significant amount of territory. Um, presumably, we forced the Germans to, uh, to have more people back on our border um, than they would have liked. They might have had some people in transit. Um, basically, every, every unit that was, uh, was defending against us was a unit that they didn't have on the front line against Poland. Obviously, we didn't save Poland. Uh, it's really quite impossible to save Poland in this game. I've seen some French players do a pretty good job of it, but uh, but we didn't do any naval landings or anything like that. Um, it really wasn't in the cards for us. They finished up the invasion of Poland uh, basically by the end of September, beginning of October, and uh, did the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which basically gave the uh, eastern half of Poland to the Soviet Union in exchange for a uh, non-aggression pact. Um, so we knew right away that it wasn't going to be an easy game. We weren't going to have a pissed off Soviet Union come in and immediately declare war on Germany or anything like that. We would need to wait at least uh, at least three years, really, for the Soviets to get pissed off enough at the Germans to actually attack. And you can see the, the avenues of German attack uh, in this screen. They, they decided that they wanted to close off uh, their northern border by attacking Denmark. And they also pushed in a little bit further on our little salient there um, by the by the Maginot line. In response, we decided that the best course of action would be to save Denmark, at least as best as we possibly could, and we dropped a full core, I believe it was a 13th core, um, off in Denmark, and they, uh, they basically garrisoned Copenhagen uh, and pushed back the Germans to uh, a small island uh, immediately to the west of the main uh, Danish island and held it basically for the entirety of the war. The 13th Corps was basically on that island for the entirety of the war. For the next six years, they were on that on that island, uh, fending off German attacks across the strait. It's a fairly uh, common tactic for a French player to attempt to do this. In, uh, in real life, Germany did have access to paratroopers and naval landing craft. Uh, why they didn't decide to, uh, to go through and uh, attempt a strike in our rear, I will never know. Um, they had ample time and opportunity to do so, but uh, I guess it just wasn't in the cards, or the AI didn't have that as an idea. But here you see, uh, it's it's December of 1939. We've held on to our little salient in Germany across the Maginot Line for about two months now at this point, but the Germans are starting to push back in earnest. And uh, by January of 1940, we've reached our pre-war borders. And aside for the little nonsense going on in Denmark, we've basically entered into the phony war yet again. There's really nothing much that happens for a good long time now uh, until July of 1940 when the Soviet Union decides to get up off their asses and actually do something. Um, they conclude a successful winter war against Finland. It's very rare that they fail in their winter war against fin Finland. Um, it is possible for Finland to do a decent amount of damage against them, but that wasn't the case here. They had a quick and easy one. And seeing a strong Soviet Union, the Romanians backed down and gave the Soviet Union a bunch of their cores. Um, in the northern section of their country, uh, letting, leading to a 
a rump um, Romania. But after this, uh, Romania has a decision to seek new allies. They can basically say, hey, we are obviously not strong enough to protect ourselves against our big bad enemies to the north. We need to look for new allies. In some situations, they can look for an alliance with Germany, um, which would have made sense, honestly, at this point, because Hungary and Slovakia, their borders, their neighbors to uh, to the northwest, were already part of the Axis alliance. It would actually make much more sense for Romania to join the Axis rather than the Allies, but since they did decide to join the Allies, we decided to send, I believe at first it was a a small force of a two core of uh, French infantry, but eventually we expanded that to a full army group of French infantry as well as French tanks and the entirety of the British Expeditionary Forces fighting in Romania. Um, Not at this point, though. I think at this point it was just two corps of infantry. And it's a good thing that we did, because in July 1940 they decided to join the Allies, but in November of 1940 they uh, were attacked from the south by uh, Bulgaria. Bulgaria did join the Axis, but didn't call the rest of the Axis in. The Axis do have a lot more wiggle room when it comes to actual war. Um, you can declare uh, what's known as a, as a limited war, which doesn't call your allies in. Um, and you do this when you think you can win easily, and you don't want to share the spoils with your allies. So Bulgaria was looking at the situation and decided that they wanted to attack Romania and take all of Romania. Like, they didn't want to share it with Hungary to the north. Hungary does have a significant amount of cores on Romanian territory and would have loved to jump in the war. And in fact, they did jump in the war just a little bit later, but because Bulgaria declared a limited war, we were able to uh, stop their advance in November of 1940 by landing um, in the north coast of Romania. And then by January, just the next month, we pushed them back and saved Bucharest, which is very close to the uh, uh, Bulgarian border. You also can see that the Soviet Union is very strong and uh, the Baltic countries decided that they were not going to fight the ultimatum. Um, The Baltic countries, meaning uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, have the ability to resist the Soviet annexation of their countries. By March of 1941, we had pushed pretty significantly into Bulgaria. Um, At this point, we began the slow process of ramping up the amount of troops in the Baltic region, and we decided that instead of conquering Bulgaria and, like, giving its land to Romania or something like that, or administering it for ourselves, we decided that we were going to go as slow as possible to make sure that we weren't going to destroy any Bulgarian divisions and just install a puppet government in their country, give them their entire country back, and have their army then fight on our side. And by May of 1941, that mission was accomplished, and we redeployed our expeditionary forces to the Hungarian and Yugoslavian borders. Now, at this point, basically nothing happened until March of next year, March of 1942, when Hungary decided that they were going to actually take their own bite out of Romania. Our expeditionary forces and the Romanian army, combined with the Bulgarian army, attempted to hold off the German army and the Hungarian army. Now, during this entire time, the Germans were constantly trying to push across the strait into into Denmark and were basically just sitting pretty behind the Maginot line and never made a move on the Low Countries. We aren't defending the Low Countries. You can see we had two full army groups deployed along the border of Belgium to rush in and do their best to attempt to save the Low Countries um, and fight in that very well defensible terrain. That was the plan all along, but that never really came to fruition. That never really happened. At this point, we we basically decided, okay, we we need to pull uh, basically a full army group from France proper and deploy them to the Balkans, deploy them to uh, Romania and use the uh, Carpathian Mountains um, to our advantage, hide in the mountains, uh, defend in the mountains and uh, delay the Germans for as long as possible. Because our strategy is to hold out until the non-aggression pact with the, between the Soviet Union and the Germans wears off, which, I mean, it's 1942 now, that won't take too long until their non-aggression pact wears out. So just hold them off for as long as possible and fight in the Balkans. Because if we're fighting the Germans in the Balkans, that means that we're not fighting the Germans in France. And that is a good thing for the French. So we lasted until April, you know, slowly losing ground, and May lost more ground, and in June we lost even more ground, and in August we were basically pushed back behind uh, the Bulgarian border, just barely holding on to Bucharest at this point. And by September, Romania folded, and uh, 
in really what was a coup. Uh, I like to think thematically that the Germans managed to surround and capture the entirety of the Romanian government and force them to surrender, force them to capitulate 100%, because they didn't become a government in exile. They just completely left. Their, their government surrendered entirely, and all of a sudden, that became German territory down there past Hungary. Hungary was given all of that formerly Romanian land, so you have a, a rather strong hung Hungary, and Germany now has an enclave. Is it an enclave? I think that would be an exclave. Yeah, that's an exclave. Germany now has an exclave down in the uh, in the Balkans, and yet another border with the Soviet Union. But we took over occupation of what uh, what little of Romania we had still under our control, basically just the coastline there, and uh, set up along the border of Bulgaria, which conveniently is a nice big river that gave us some pretty hefty defensive bonuses. But the Germans didn't push. The Germans did not advance. Uh, we held the line. Um, I don't think that the Germans really felt like they had the army strength to continue pushing down in that direction. And with the Carpathian Mountains there and pretty poor infrastructure in Romania and Hungary, um, I think they were having pretty major supply issues as well. And by May of 1943, we decided that it was time to do a counterattack. You can see we lost a little bit of land in the uh, in the north of uh, German-occupied Romania. But we collected our tanks together and uh, decided we were going to push through the plains and do our best to get a surround of a significant amount of German forces. And we did do uh, minor surrounds here and there. We took out a couple tens of thousands of, uh, of German troops, took them uh, as prisoners of war, but almost immediately, almost right when we started really pounding the Germans hard in the Balkans, the Soviets declared war on Germany. And at this point, it was a one game, right? At this point, as France, you know you've won. If you've survived to see the Soviets declare war on Germany, you know that you can survive um, whatever the Germans throw at you because they need to deploy the majority of their armies to deal with the Soviets. And quite simply, the Germans didn't deploy enough to deal with the Soviets because by the end of May, by the end of that month, the Germans had already advanced almost a couple hundred miles um, into Germany. That also allowed us to advance pretty significantly in the Balkan region and uh, retake much of South Romania. We also decided that the Italians had basically emptied their country in an attempt to help the Germans shore up their front line with the Soviets. So we moved an army south um, down to the, uh, the border region that we share with Italy in preparation for an attack on Italy proper uh, with the hope of uh, basically taking Rome out and holding the, uh, the mountains in the south of Germany against any German counterattack. This is the state of the borders when we, when we actually did declare war on Italy in June of 1943. Um, you can see that uh, Finland did join the Axis in declaring war on the Soviet Union and, well, let's just say that didn't work out too well for them. Their country is basically 100% occupied at this point. They haven't surrendered yet, and they did become a government in exile, causing some, uh, some issues for the Soviet Union in terms of partisans. But also uh, significant to note is that the uh, Soviet advance has slowed rather significantly at this point. The advance took uh, a couple hundred miles of territory including uh, Konigsberg in uh, in that first month, but they have advanced at a snail's pace since then. And they've been held at the Carpathian Mountains by the combined um, Hungarian and German forces. So, uh, so Germany all in all is putting up a pretty effective defense while fighting um, a two-front, maybe even a three-front war, depending on whether or not you count the Balkan region as a completely separate front. Uh, but by the middle of June, we'd advanced fairly significantly into northern Italy, basically just brushing aside Italian resistance. The advance in uh, Romania has slowed down significantly. We, uh, we discovered that we were having uh, significant supply issues, and so we had started withdrawing our tanks at this point from the, uh, from the front, um, which slowed us down significantly and took away a significant amount of our, uh, our stopping power, especially when fighting against the, uh, the German armored forces. But on the uh, North African front, we basically faced no resistance whatsoever. We, we swept aside any Italian resistance with our, um, our motorized troops that we deployed to that region and, uh, and basically just pushed through without any real problems at all. By the end of June, we took over a significant amount of the Italian north. We were uh, racing the British um, over to Benghazi in North Africa. We have also started to push even deeper into uh, occupied Romania, Although we still haven't reached 
Hungary's home territory, yet they're doing a very good job of holding us off, and in some cases even pushing us back. Uh, by July of 1943, just the next month, we've advanced into the, uh, the northern mountains, the southern mountains of Germany, and are facing fairly stiff resistance while half of our army, half of our um, Italian army, is currently occupied in the siege of Rome. You can also see that the Greeks have decided to join the Allies at this point, and are advancing into Albania. We have reached the outskirts of Benghazi before the British, haha, the inner neener, and um, are currently laying siege to that important Italian town as well, and the surrender of Italy is imminent. Uh, we decided to do the exact same thing to Italy that we did with Bulgaria. Uh, rather than conquer their territory, we installed a puppet state and did our best to destroy as little of the Italian army as possible. And by August, that job was complete and our front line with Germany has once again stabilized. The British were the ones who actually took Benghazi, even though we were uh, laughing and joking about them. I think I basically just forgot the North African front and the British were able to take Benghazi uh, before we could get there. The front in Romania has basically stymied yet again. Um, that really isn't a front that it's possible for us to advance in uh, with the army that we're capable of supporting on just that one front. Um, one thing that we uh, we did discuss in our videos were that uh, I completely neglected naval basing research. Uh, so our ports were incredibly inefficient when it comes to actually transporting supplies, and that's one thing that really could have helped us there. We were facing some serious supply issues, um, fighting in pretty nasty terrain against a mechanized force, put up a really, really tough fight, stiff resistance even when we outnumbered them practically two to one. At this point, we decided to redeploy the entire British expeditionary force that Great Britain so graciously gave to us um, to our Maginot Line, basically an effort to end the war as quickly as possible, and out of a desire to make sure that the Soviets didn't take over all of Germany. Um, you always play for the end game, right? And the end game is to have a, as weak a Soviet block as possible, while uh, having as strong a uh, allied block as possible, especially when you're playing as France or Great Britain or something like that. So with the combined uh, allied forces now numbering uh, Bulgaria, Greece, Italy, uh, the new Italy anyway, uh, France, and the United Kingdom, um, we decide to basically push forward on all fronts as quickly as we can to prevent the Soviet Union from taking as much territory as we can. And here is the fruit of our efforts. You can see that the, the front in uh, Romania has basically just been stymied. Um, we leave as many troops down there as we can supply and defend the border, basically. That's, that's our only goal in that region. Um, we're advancing north. Uh, through the Alps. I believe those are the Alps. Please forgive me if I'm wrong. Although, holy cow, I should know the mountain ranges, shouldn't I? My goodness. But we also advanced north through the Luxembourg area. Um, Germany has really heavily armored, uh, mechanized, and, uh, and medium armored units that take a long time to punch through, but at this point they're really suffering for more units to throw at their front lines. So we decide that the best course of action for us would be to extend the front line as far as possible. So we basically head straight north and uh, extend the Italian front line in the south. Great Britain actually makes themselves useful and uh, makes a naval landing uh, near near Hamburg on the north German coast. And they, uh, they somehow manage to stay there, although we decide that we need to help them as much as possible. And uh, by December of 1943, we've rushed up there and made as long of a front as we physically can. And this made it really, really easy for us to basically bypass any German resistance because most of their army is, you know, facing the Soviets. Um, at this point, the Soviets have almost marched to Berlin. Hungary is still holding out remarkably well with the, uh, with the assistance of those mountains down there. Um, but the Germans are putting up a stiff resistance to the Soviet advance, and by extending our front line as much as, as, much as we can, we can ensure that we take as much territory as possible um, while facing as little German resistance as possible. By January of 1944, we see the fruit of our efforts. We've basically taken uh, almost half of modern-day Germany, half of uh, Austria, and uh, are basically advancing on all fronts except for the Hungarian one. By March of 1944, the Axis had surrendered. The Soviets were the ones who uh, forced the Hungarian surrender and the Slovakian surrender. But in a coup that I still can't believe we managed to pull off, we were the ones who marched into Berlin. I do not know how um, the Germans, in a last-ditch effort to save the defenders of Berlin, 
punched through the Soviet lines, managed to hold out against the Soviets just long enough for us to come and basically take Berlin out from underneath the Soviets' noses. That's that little, uh, that little blip in the Soviet lines right there. It was really funny. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, a well-won game, in my opinion. Um, now, I did go through, I mean, I figured I was making these maps. I might as well make an end game map anyway. I, I did go through and, um, and sail over and defeat Japan. Um, I didn't want to bother with uh, province assigning over there or anything like that. But uh, one more interesting ha thing happened was that the unaligned Yugoslavia decided to declare war on everybody, just stab everyone in the back. Um, Soviets and uh, French, Bulgarian, Greek, and Italian troops all assisted in uh, in taking the Yugoslavians down, and we decided to puppet them, which is, has been our strategy all along, rather than annex them. Um, and uh, to do so, I mean, it was basically just rush down the victory points as quickly as we possibly can to make sure that the Soviets get as little victory points as possible. Uh, because if we have more victory points when they're over their surrender threshold, we are the ones who actually um, get to take the surrender, and uh, the entirety of Yugoslavia is then a puppet under us, rather than, you know, conquered by the Soviets, or split between us and the Soviets. So this is my uh, New World Order map mode, um, and I feel I need to explain some things. Um, I felt like uh, the Russians wouldn't necessarily set up a completely separate satellite state in Finland, considering how close it is to uh, to um, the uh, the very important city of uh, of Saint Petersburg or Leningrad or whichever one you wanted to call it, um, but uh, I think that they would have been hard pressed to negotiate with the Allies about keeping Poland under their control anyway. So basically, um, I figured they'd release Poland as the um, the pseudo rump state that it is today. Uh, it doesn't include all of the territory that it previously included, and they basically moved it um, over to the west just a little bit. <laughs> like, uh, um, modern-day Poland and pre-war Poland bear almost no resemblance to each other when you really look at it, but uh, but that's, that's how it is. Um, Greece, uh, I gave formerly Italian Albania to. I was really tossing it up in my head um, as to whether or not Albania would exist as a separate country, like, would France and England insist on an independent Albania? And I really don't think that they, they would. Um, really, the driving force at the, uh, at the end of the war treaties for decolonization and de-imperialism was the United States of America. And guess what? The USA did not participate in the war in Europe nearly at all, and we were the ones who actually went and invaded Japan to force their surrender. So, really, there were no anti-imperialism forces at the table. France and England still have their massive empires, and there's no real sign of them uh, going away anytime soon. So, I just decided to divide the empires up. Um, so, uh, Greece was the one who actually invaded Albania, so they now administer Albania. Um, Bulgaria and uh, Romania and Italy all helped with the uh, the subjugation of Yugoslavia when they stabbed us in the back. So they got some former Yugoslav territories, um, including South Serbia. Um, the, the, the nation of South Serbia is now administered by Bulgaria. And some uh, regions that were claimed by the Italians um, at the end of World War I, but they weren't given, uh, when when Austria-Hungary was broken up, I had uh, just uh, assigned them to Italy as well. Um, speaking of Italy, their uh, former colony down in Libya was split between the English and the French, um, basically at the points um, where they met. So uh, the English get Benghazi, but basically everything to the west of that um, goes to the French North African um, territories. Uh, the English kept their administrative district in the north of Germany, and the French kept the region directly around the uh, the Maginot Line. The uh, at the end treaties um, of World War II, the French were really adamant about making sure that the new German nation, whatever it was going to be, would be weak, so nothing like this could ever happen again. They they wanted to make sure this time, after the failure of World War One, to prevent another world war that no new world war could ever happen again. And it was really only through the United States' intervention um, at those peace talks 
that the uh, the mostly unified German state as we know it today um, exists. There was even talk of splitting Germany up into uh, four or five different states, uh, like Hamburg and Bavaria and the Rhineland um, and, and Prussia, you know, uh, reviving the old princely states of the Holy Roman Empire and turning them into the new the new countries that would make up Germany. The hope being that these five countries would never unite again together and uh, and turn around and attack Europe and um, try to make a, a, a German order in Europe, if you will. I decided that uh, Denmark was a, a good little buddy in the war, even though they really didn't contribute much of anything at all and were really only attacked for six years in a row. But hey, whatever, they get to administer the, uh, the canal through Kiel and... Uh, and I granted them the city of Lubeck um, just for uh, for laughs, I, I suppose, really. Um, historically, the, the king of Denmark did have a claim on uh, on northern Pomerania, the, the coastline there, but really that was, that was rather soundly defeated back in the 1800s. <laughs> um, Denmark was kicked out of Germany proper pretty firmly. Uh, there's really no justified reason to give them the North German coast, but uh, I figure it's just an administrative region and it can be integrated into the uh, um, the, the Federal German Republic um, soon enough. Um, speaking of the uh, the FGR or the FRG, I really don't know which way you say it, that's that uh, big sort of grayish brown blob in the middle there. Um, that's the, uh, the Allied Control Territory and the brown blob is the DDR, um, the, uh, the Soviet bloc um, German country. Um, there was some little uh, uh, switching of territory around just to make sure that everything was nice and even. And uh, predominantly in the Balkans, uh, the Soviet Union traded away the conquered Romanian territory, and we traded away our conquered Hungarian territory, and we traded away our conquered Czech territory, and they traded away their conquered Austrian territory. So the Soviets now have uh, Czechoslovakia, Poland, the DDR, Finland, Hungary, and we have um, the Federal German Republic, Austria, Yugoslavia, Romania, Bulgaria, and Greece, as well as Italy. Um, so this is the New World Order heading into uh, uh, a new and slightly different Cold War one that includes France as a world power with, uh, at this point, I believe the fourth largest army in the world. And I, I have to say that we did fairly well for, uh, for only being number four in terms of army size. Thank you all for, uh, for joining me on this one, and I hope you'll join me for the next series. I do think it's going to be Japan, but you are more than welcome to, uh, to leave any suggestions in the comments section. Thank you much. Have a good one.